first uh, introduction. My name is Scott Barlas. I work at Gaspar Games. I am a uh, engineer there. I tend to do back-end systems, uh, parsers and scripting languages and file systems and that kind of stuff. I don't usually mess around with pixel shaders and whatever. Um, hopefully you guys are all and girls are all system architect types, um, although it's difficult to get involved with a game object system, or it's difficult to avoid that if you're working on a game. You always end up at messing with it in some way or another. Um, hopefully you're tired of fighting with statically typed systems for game code. If you don't know what that means, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the test subject for this is Dungeon Siege, which uh, went goal a couple days ago, finally. And uh, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, with uh, every game I work on, I always use it as a test bed for random technologies I want to develop because, uh, well, that's what games are, right? A lot of it's R&D, uh, especially when we don't know what we're doing, which was certainly the case with Dungeon Siege. Um, in the game, there are about 7,300 unique object types. Those are things that can be placed in the world with the editor. Um, and our crazy level designers went and put uh, over 100,000 of them in the world. Um, I, that's actually way conservative. It's probably more like 150,000. It's just like click, 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 and putting down all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's huge. And the extra complication to all of this is that it's a continuous world, right? No loading screens was our big bullet point on the box. Well, it's very expensive on uh, that you can pretty much go to any part of the world at any time because they put in these fancy teleporter thingies that make you, you can teleport from here to here, and suddenly you have a completely different everything. So pretty much everything needs to be in memory at once, uh, at least the lookup tables for all this you know, different object types. Oh, yeah, uh, before I forget, uh, if your phone has a silencer on it, I hope it does, please use it. Um, I'd hate to have the theme song of your favorite TV show coming on if you're going to talk. So, uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to be trying to talk really fast. I think I have way too many slides, <laughs> so I'm going to try and cram this in. Uh, first definition is data-driven. Uh, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, what data-driven to me means is basically you don't have to bother with an engineer. Engineers, as we all know, are very slow, and they take forever to get anything done, which drives all of your artists and designers crazy, because they'll come to an engineer and say, I want this feature, and he'll say, yeah, okay, it's on the list, and it's you know at the bottom beneath all the other stuff, and they'll end up just hacking around the problem. So the goal of a data-driven system is to remove the engineer from the picture as much as possible, keep the designers close to the, to the game, being able to implement stuff quickly. And of course, that means removing C and C++. Let the engineers build the engines. That's my view on what a data-driven system is. And it keeps moving the line between the two things. Like a few years ago, it was like, if the, you know, the names of your animations and your textures are not hard-coded into your C++ code or C code, then it's considered data-driven. And past that now, so now it's to the point where the, the, the game doesn't even know what, what a monster is. All it knows is that there is some script out there somewhere telling some animation to run. Um, especially with the newer, more generic engines that are that are coming out, the licensing stuff. So, the next definition I want to talk about is that what is it, a game object exactly? Um, we call it at GBG. Let's call it a Go game object. So if I say Go, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying leave the room. Um, basically, it means it's a Go is just a piece of uh, interactive content. It's a self-contained thing. And if you, you, you look at a game like Baldur's Gate or something, it'd be a sword, or it'd be an actor who's running around, or, or in Quake, it's the, mods, the, the models and all those different things. Uh, basically, anything that's interactive and somehow the player can mess around with. Um, some examples of those are you know, trees and bushes and monsters and all those things there. Um, a lot of the goes you never actually see, so they're not necessarily visible things, like uh, trigger volumes and uh, uh, command waypoint path thingies and, and camera commands and all these different things. You may not necessarily see them. Uh, we call those gizmos. Um, every game has them in some form or another, I think. Not all of them are a unified system. Well, some of them subdivide, but for the purposes of this talk, it's going to be a unified system where Go is everything. Um, the the self-contained logic that they do perform, uh, if you think about it divided down along capability lines, tends to be things like, like I put here, rendering, pathfinding, path following, path colliding, speaking, all those kinds of fun things. There's nothing really special about Go's, but just so we're on the same page of what I think they are. And the game object system is uh, obviously the thing that manages these things. It constructs them according to a spec. It says, here, create this thing, put it in the world, and it will often map messages to the thing, and uh, you can look it up by ID. 
Um, in our system, every Go has an ID of some kind, because uh, if you send it over the network, you can't send a pointer, so you got to send an ID. Um, right. So today, games are having some crazy amounts of content. And whenever I say content, I'm not talking about movies. Even though movies have huge amounts of assets, from the point of view of the engine, it's one piece of content. It's play the movie, right? So it doesn't really matter to us. Um, I'm talking about content in terms of you know, crazy textures and, and models and animations and all the different things that come together to make the game what it is. So it's actually getting worse or, or better if, if your glass is half full type of person. So over time, our engines, our engines have to uh, accommodate more and more and more types of content. So say you're an engineer and you're going out to go construct a new game object system from scratch and you go up to your designer and they, of course, start flaying their arms and frothing at the mouth. And they're like, OK, we want to have trees and rocks and bushes and levers and elevators and doors and all these different crazy things. And they trail off. And you start thinking about C++ ways that you can solve the problem. You know, fancy, like, how would I take what's, what's similar between a tree and a lever? What do they have in common? They both can render. And you start thinking in terms of how to uh, arrange your class structure so that you can uh, so you can represent it well in code and be flexible and all that stuff. So you go to the bookstore and you, just to be safe, you buy a book on how to do it. And it says, go fire up your $5,000 UML editor and create something like this. Um, obviously, no one's going to actually create this for a real commercial game. But you get the idea of what I'm talking about, where you divide it down based on uh, what makes sense based on the, the purpose or the, the functionality of the object. A friend or foe missile is a special type of missile. It probably overrides some function like uh, track or something overrides the virtual function, provides specialized behavior. And you would have some kind of global factory thing that says which one to create based on some file that says which one to load. So this is, this is like the old way of doing it, probably. If you look at the older books, they always recommend something like this, where you, you have just this big hierarchy of all the possible object types, all specialized nicely like this. The, the newer way is to do something like this, where you kind of you look at your functionality and you decompose it into different classes based on uh, capabilities. This thing can be drawn. This thing can be collided. This thing is chewable. I, that's a bad example, but I couldn't think of anything else. So, and then what you do is, uh, this is a kind of a, it's sometimes called mix-in uh, classes, where you, you want to create a new type, and you, you derive it from all the uh, stuff that you think is important. So the problem is, none of them will work. Um, there's probably hundreds of ways that you could go and try and decompose your problem domain into a set of classes, into a nice little hierarchy. Many different models on how to do it. You can go to the bookstore and find a stack of them, and they're all wrong. Whoa, excuse me. They're all wrong, but not initially. Initially, they work just great. They fulfill the purpose. You uh, create your system. You hand it off to the designers, and you go along your merry way onto your next scheduled tasks until they come back to you and ask for something different that you weren't expecting, and your particular model wasn't prepared for that. How many times have we read in, in postmortems um, where they'll talk about designs that were too ambitious and needed to be scaled back, or massive changes midstream, or the marketing guys wanted this, or they had to add this other thing to be competitive? Um, I, I was just at a talk uh, a couple hours ago Warren Spector gave, and he, he, he put up the perfect slide. I had to write this down because it so well represents what I'm trying to say here. He said, no matter how much planning you do, you still don't know what the game is going to, what game you're making until you actually make it. So given that fact, I mean, empirical fact, at least it's always been true of the games I've worked on, you're going to be running into change that your, uh, your carefully planned system isn't going to like very well. Your designer is going to come up to you one day and say, OK, that asteroid, we want to make an alien asteroid that can kind of heat seek, right? And then you start trying to figure out how you can derive this new heat seeking asteroid from these two different things, and then they want it to do something else. And it just, it just doesn't work. Or in the case of Dungeon Siege, say you, uh, you have all these static trees, and they just sit there. And then one day, the designers are like, wouldn't it be cool if they swayed in the wind? And you start thinking, wait a minute, there's static objects, and the animatable ones over on this branch of the tree. And we could derive this common thing. It just doesn't work, right? Oh, wait, did I cover that? Yeah. The, the key point here is that the designer doesn't really think about, they don't know about the engineering concerns. It's not, it's not in their heads. So whenever they come up with some change they want, it doesn't really, they have no way of knowing that it destroys your whole type structure. 
Um, so just given, it's a lot easier. Just accept that there's going to be change and you have to deal with it. The closer your code ends up getting to the content, the more and more fuzzy it's going to end up being, the, the requirements of what the code is going to have to do, and the more often it's going to have to change, you're going to have to refactor your code to accommodate the changes that are required. And if you resist that, it's going to cause worse problems, the, the hacking around um, thing that I mentioned. So in software engineering, we are taught that you take the parts of the uh, system that vary and you abstract those. You take whatever's likely to change, like a blister on your foot, and you push it away from you, and you put up all these walls and stuff to protect you from whatever's going to be changing. And that's what the whole point of this uh, is uh, architecture is, is all about, is you can, the change is, if you happen to model it correctly, you can just add a new class into the tree. And the problem with that is what I mentioned. If you get hit from a completely different angle that you weren't expecting, you abstracted the tree based on capability, and then someone comes along and they want to be able to extract, they want to be able to mix and match different pieces, and it's just not going to work. And the problem is not that we're no good at our jobs. It's that the language is very limiting. Um, C++ is actually not a very flexible language when it comes to that. Think about, uh, it's called hardening. I've heard some people refer to it. Over time, your code just kind of gets stuck in a rut and you can't change it because you have all these other classes that are including this one thing they're deriving from it or they're calling functions into there or they're overriding a bunch of virtual functions. You can't just look at your tree and someone's decided they want to rearrange some capabilities. You can't just like re-derive it from something else or you're going to have problems. And I think it's been, uh, I think it's best described. There's a, a Age of Empires or Age of Empires II postmortem where it, I think it was Herb talked about it. He said they had a real problem with that where um, they had this deep hierarchy and all these virtual functions were overriding this and that and they couldn't change anything because there's a, hidden rules in the system with the way that it behaves. This thing overrides the draw method of that. It's supposed to come before this. And by trying to rearrange it, you break all that. You cause different uh, bugs in the code that you, don't, you weren't expecting. Needless to say, it requires a lot of work to rearrange your class tree. You can't just go in there and rename a bunch of stuff. So what happens is you end up getting hacks put in because the engineers are frustrated. Um, some of the most common ones I've seen are where it's a process called hoisting where you, you've got your nice little tree and uh, it, people take the classes that were derived and they move them up into the base class and make the base class bigger. And they take all the little different pieces of functionality that were in there and they make them bools. So inside of there you've got some function that does whatever and it says if this feature is turned on, implement, you know, do this thing. And if this feature is turned off, do this other thing. Basically, you're moving the switch statement back up. And, I mean, it, it's eliminating all of your hard work. You're ending up with this big monolithic class that's kind of like if else all over the place to get what you want done. Spaghetti, right? Um, the virtual override madness I talked about. Um, and that stuff doesn't matter. So what I'd like to do is step back a bit and re-examine the problem. This is actually a database that we're working on here, right? Like... Um, the, all the different objects that are in the system, the game objects, they're part of a, if you think about it as a traditional database, and they're all lines inside of that thing, it's just a big-ass table like an Excel spreadsheet or something where all of the different uh, member variables are just columns in the table, and then they're the lines going down. This is a very well-understood problem. In fact, they've been doing this for decades. Uh, a friend of mine that I, I worked with for a while was a database engineer. Uh, she did ESPN Sports Zone, if you use it. Um, she said, the data is important, nothing else matters. That was a very key uh, quote for me that I'll never forget. Uh, regardless of what algorithms you're using or what type structures you're using, all this other garbage, the only thing that really matters in your system is the content that's been created by your content developers. They've spent all this time building this stuff. And we end up putting it into this database, the hard-coded game engine, where we have this class which implements these variables and all these things. We're hard-coding it every time. That's why it's so difficult to rearrange it based on the changing needs of the designer. If we want to rearrange it, we have to go through a lot of work to, to implement that, which ends up causing resistance to change, which is not what you want in a dynamic gaming environment, game development environment. So what I propose here, and what we had, what ended up doing for Dungeon Siege, is you actually take the structure of the data, what's called the schema and database language, you take that and you abstract that, you turn that into data, you data drive that. So you just get rid of the whole tree and you, you break it down in little pieces, and you data drive how they fit together. And that's what the rest of this talk about, is the component system that I implemented. So a little while ago, I mentioned uh, the mix-in classes, where it's drawable or it's collidable or whatever. If you were to take each of those and make it a completely self-contained class, 
and then plug those components into a single game object and then drive that using data but not using code, then you have a really flexible system that lets you build whatever you want. You can mix and match whatever is required. You don't have to go figure out the best way to derive this thing from that thing and see which virtual functions work right, which ones you need to override. It doesn't confuse your junior programmers who come on and have no idea how this stuff works, which is actually a really key issue. Not everybody's senior. So the quick overview of this is you just, you take uh, some kind of feature, like uh, whether or not something can draw. Uh, it's going to have a model, it's going to have a texture, something like that, and then you put that into a single component. And if you have a game object type that needs to be able to draw, such as a tree, you stick that into there. Now it's able to draw itself. If it also needs to be able to animate, you stick the animate component inside of there. And each of these components is a self-contained piece of logic that knows how to do whatever job you've decided for it. And it's a flat system. For the data itself, you still want to keep the specialization tree. You want to keep the, the, the hierarchy because it is actually very useful to be able to reuse, uh, reuse data in that way. It's just that you move it over to a data-driven system so you don't have to re... So it's a lot easier to mess around with data than code. You can even automate it with Perl scripts if you want, if it's something that happens a lot. So, for example, in Dungeon Siege, here are some components like the placement component. It keeps track of and knows about placement in the world. The uh, body component is responsible for animation. It knows how to play chores and things like that. The mind component, component does the thinking, high-level uh, AI-level jobs. It uh, knows how to perform those. And the inventory component manages inventory and equipment state. So if you've got some object that doesn't need to have inventory, don't give it the component. But in, in a traditional system, what would probably end up happening, and what did happen on Dungeon Siege before we redid it, was we just take the derived class that had inventory and just take the inventory part and you move it up in the base class. And now everything's got inventory and it's cluttering up the code and it takes more CPU to initialize and it's just generally more complicated. So in the case of the, the, sway, the, the animating tree thing, you just add an animate component to it. Oh wait, external schema. Um, one thing you want to do is enforce an external schema. Um, one problem in uh, game development is documentation. I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm not very good at documenting. I have a hard enough time documenting my code, right? And I write some kind of tool or I write some kind of component that I want somebody to be able to use. Keeping the component is constantly changing to the needs of design. And keeping a document up to date is just something that's not going to happen. I mean, I could try to do it. I just don't have the discipline for that. And conveniently, a lot of other engineers have that same problem. But what you can do is uh, take the schema itself. You know, the list of all the different uh, fields that the component supports and the documentation about it and put it outside the code into a separate file that everybody can look at, even the editor can query. I'll, I'll get more into that in a bit. So implementing this system uh, requires kind of two spheres of, uh, two uh, categories of classes. One is to manage the dynamic content, one is to manage the static content. Dynamic content to me is just the goes. Just the stuff in the game that is available for the session does its thing, dies, and then goes away. The static content is stuff that's done outside of the game, done in the editor, done by um, designers or, producer, or assistant producers that are managing the uh, schema or they're managing the, the data going to the schema. That's the division there. The static content is going to be huge, right? That's the 7,000 object types I was talking about. Whereas the dynamic content is going to be much smaller. It's whatever the game is currently using, the, the list of available trees. Just available trees, rocks, and all that other stuff. So let's start with the dynamic content layout first. And again, this, this is, I'm just describing the system that Dungeon Seed uses as a, uh, just a way to describe this system, the component system. So the dynamic content is built from a Go. And a Go is just an object that contains Go components, and that's it. It's very simple. It's got a list of Go components inside of it. It's got a query function that lets you look things up by name. Every component has a name. And then it will have little pointers, like the Go placement and Go body pointers, that are cached values. Uh, a lot of times, you want to have instantaneous access to these things. Like, you don't want to do a query and then iterate through everything doing string queries just to look up something you know is already supposed to be there. So you have pointers that cache that for performance reasons. And basically, uh, oh yeah, components are unique within a Go. That's just the, the method I took just to keep things simple, um, to prevent problems with uh, you got two objects of the same kind, somebody does a query for that name, 
But it turned out we actually want to have the ability to have multiple of the same type in the same go. So I've got to figure that out for the next game. But for simplicity, it's easier just to make them all uniquely named. So it's just a list of components in the Go, and that's the whole thing. The Go is just a list of these things. Um, the Go does not have derivatives. It's not permitted to have derivatives. The way you extend the class is by adding components or replacing components. And the Go itself doesn't do much. It just uh, it owns its components. It manages the parent-tree relationship. Uh, there's parent-child relationship among all the Go's, and it does some other miscellaneous stuff. Go components where the, all the where all the money is poured in. That's the real dynamic stuff. And you pretty much have one per whatever you can think up you need. If you need inventory, you create an inventory component. If you need placement, you create a placement component. If you need a, a special elevator thingy component, then you create one of those. Um, the Go component base class, it's an abstract base class. It provides basic functions like handle message, commit creation, uh, link parent, things like that. And uh, most systems in the game don't even care about these derivative Go placement and all that stuff. They just work through the Go component. So whenever I want to send a message to an object and say activate, you know, like pull the lever, we send a use message to the thing. And then it just gets sent to all the components inside of there, and whoever's interested in it will listen for it and wake up and perform whatever interactive content they need to do, like play an animation. One important extension, and I can't stress this enough. Um, script is just the name of my scripting language. Um, it became very obvious right away whenever I was putting this together that we didn't want to do it all in C++. In fact, we wanted to be able to create components out of script. And that was a really good idea. I highly recommend it, being able to create stuff not in C++. You just leave the high-performance stuff in C++, the stuff that needs advanced features that the language doesn't support, which are, there are many in script that doesn't support. Um, the, the, the big advantage, though, is this permits extremely fast prototyping. Because the compiler is mine and not Microsoft's, I can do it in the game. So what we were able to do is you can add new components, you can tweak existing ones, change them all on the fly in the game while it's running. And you don't have to wait for another build from another engineer who's got the task inserted you know, wherever in his queue. So it compresses the development time. You get a lot rap more rapid development. A uh, designer comes up with some crazy idea and they give it to Eric to go implement. And he can probably whip it out in an hour. You get an engineer to do it, it's going to take him you know, a couple days and they got to give him another build and... You know, they fetch code and it probably everything's broken anyway. It's just a lot easier to avoid that whole build process. So, right. Let's get that one. Oh, yeah, one thing. Uh, the, the schema for the script would be internal. I'll, I'll get to that later. But it's all auto-detected from, uh, from the language itself. Uh, implementation for something like this is actually really easy. If you have a scripting language like you know, Java or Python or something like that, it probably, I've never used those languages, but I'm sure they have some way that you can pass methods to it, you can pass uh, events to it. So all you got to do is just create a, a derivative of this, uh, this thing here, the Go script component. Just create a derivative Go component, and then it just implements all of those virtual functions and then passes them straight through to the script, right? And so it's all up to the script to do whatever. And so an example of that would be in our game, we have the, you know, the lever script component. It uh, just listens for a re uh, request to use itself. And then whenever it gets that, it's like it handles that and then, you know, basically does game code. All the game code we want to be in the scripting language. And uh, the key is most of the game doesn't care about whether it's in C++, it doesn't care if it's script, because it deals with everything at the Go component level, right? So the editor doesn't care. The editor, for all they know, is it's just editing a bunch of values. And the designers don't even care. So I think it worked out pretty well. We ended up with like 20, 21 C++ components. I just did a quick query. You know, things like attack is, uh, manages uh, how much damage you can do. The fader manages trying to fade out an object after we've deleted it. Uh, the mine manages the uh, high-level jobs. And then everything else we wrote in the script component. Uh, Eric wrote in the script components. And there's quite a number of those, but I don't think you can see that. Um, they tend to be things like a generator or something that uh, gives off an animation command. The thing is, it's so easy to create one of those. You just do it all the time, and who cares? It's just, you know, it's just, <laughs> oh, sorry. It's just um, very easy to prototype stuff. Okay, so the next section I'm going to be talking about um, the, the static content side of things. One thing that you're going to require on your game engine, I assume everybody's got this already, but I never know, um, some kind of generic data store, some way of saying uh, store and retrieve name value pairs, you know, pretty simple stuff. 
where you can arrange it into blocks or something like that. Um, Gabriel Knight 3, we had an INI file, you know, which we just used. Some people use XML, and uh, I've heard of people using RIF. On this game, um, we have something called GAS, which is like an INI file with nesting and then like a million other little features that we added. Anyway, you need something that's able to just send and retrieve basic values. It's a plus if it can do it in binary, so faster and more efficient, but it's not that important. And it's not too hard to make your own if you don't have one. So the static content side of things. Okay, so uh, the Go data template is what we call a template in the game. It's not a template in the C++ term. It's a template in terms of like an actual real template, like a pattern that you copy something from. Whenever you create a Go, you have a Go data template that determines how it is to be constructed. It's, it's a specification, a blueprint, a schema of how it's supposed to be constructed. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Go and its Go data component. Inside of the Go, you have Go components. Those correspond exactly with the Go data components. And so looking at the Go data, data template, it's just got a, the same thing as the Go. It's a list of components. It's got a pointer to the data, the fuel handle is what we call that stuff. And then it's got a pointer to its base. Like I mentioned before, there's a tree of these things, right? So you want to be able to know who your base is so you can specialize, have custom data that overrides. And the point of that is to you know, save time so you don't have to copy paste an entire block of data just to get something slightly different. You just specialize a little bit and change the value that's different. The Go data component, just a list of, it's pretty much just data plus schema. It's a bunch of raw data for the fields, like the actual values, the actual floats, ints, strings, and all that junk. It's got storage for that. And there is a spec, a table spec, um, which I'll get to in a second, that says what the data is organized like, because you can't just have a pile of data. You've got to know what it's, what it's organized like. And the optional script object, if it is a script component. Oh, one thing I should point out, um, why have these two separate systems? Uh, the, the static components and the data, the dynamic data components. And I, it's because you can't possibly instantiate one of every single object in the entire game. You'd be loading every texture and every model and every whatever. So instead, you, inst you instantiate every, all the data that represents what you could instantiate in the game. And you try and keep that as efficient as possible. That's why we have a 128 meg minimum spec on our game. <laughs> Not that it necessarily uses a lot of memory. Um, I think it's about seven megs for all of this stuff. It's not too bad. But we, again, we have 7,000 objects, or 7,000 types. I mean, I, that's crazy, don't do that. Okay. Um, the table spec, which is stored inside of a Go data component, is just the information about the fields. And this is pretty standard stuff, right? It's got a name, it's got a type. You're gonna have some enum that's like int, float, vector three, GP string, whatever. Flags that are uh, how the type is modified. Like we have one called localized. That means whenever I read the data, the constant data from the, the disk, I automatically run it through the translator so that it, you know, it's in the right language. And I'm not talking about like a real translator. It's just a dictionary mapping English to whatever language. Um, a default value, most things have those set up, and then documentation. And again, everything's always got docs at all times, including the table spec, which has its own name and docs. Docs are very important that they are put directly into this stuff. Otherwise, it just won't happen. Jeez, I gotta hurry up. Okay. So next we're going to talk, talk operation. If this seems a little confusing right now, I'm going to be getting to actual hard, you know, here's some text that shows how to, specif how to specify this stuff very quickly. So, one second. The operation of the system. The first thing you have to do in order to make it usable is you have to compile it, right? Game starts up, you got to figure out what's out there, what can be built. And we store the schema for the C++ stuff in a file called components.cast. And it looks like this, sort of. Just a bunch of these vertically. There's um, a block that gets opened and says, here's the component. Its name is GUI. Uh, GUI components are used for things that can go in inventory because they can have a little GUI bitmap that you can drag around. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of fields missing here. There's, there's probably 30 fields. And then there's a bunch of other components in the same file. This is just one thing. Documentation is required. The game will complain if it's not there. That doesn't stop people from putting in lousy docs, but at least they're there. Required component is uh, something that says that this component assumes that there is another component there, meaning like it's going to crash if it's not there. So this will actually refuse to instantiate any templates that don't meet that uh, constraint. 
And then for each of the individual fields, like inventory icon, this is all the stuff I just mentioned in the table specs. There's a, a type, and there's a default value, and there's docs for that. You can also set flags that I didn't, I didn't add to this example. So once you process that file, you have basically the schema for all of your C++ components. What about your script components? Well, that's a lot easier, actually. You just find, uh, in, in our system, I just have a directory called components that we stick all of them in, and we put them in subdirectories just because it's con more convenient to work in. And you just recursively scan all those, compile all those, and then um, in the compiler, I've got meta, meta info stuff that I can read out that says uh, here are the different um, exported properties and stuff. And that's what, script doesn't look like this. This is just like, it's highly compressed. But it's got like property, string, effect. So we've got the name of the uh, field that's being exported. We've got the type. And we've got documentation on it and a default value all in this one place. This is just an extension I put into script to support this stuff. And uh, I think uh, Unreal has something like this where they, uh, you put like open close parens on something and that means that goes in the editor or something. I thought that was pretty cool so I copied it. I copied a lot of Unreal stuff. Is anyone working on Unreal here? Yeah, good stuff. So, right. You compile these script, you build the table specs. Now we've got the schema. Now we know the structure of the data that we can start feeding data into it, right? And that's the next step. We build templates. The first stage of this is just preparation work, just to get the list of available templates and whatever, and then we start filling them out later. So you go to the top of your template tree and recursively scan it. It doesn't actually have to be a physical tree, like subdirectories with, with each individual object. You can arrange it however you want. The only thing that matters is um, there's this specializes field. This is an actual like specification for a template. We're, we're defining a chicken. And uh, the third field down is specializes equals, and it says, okay, this chicken white specializes base chicken. So that's how the tree is built, pretty much. It's sort of like uh, in C++ where you go colon, public, whatever. So you scan all these templates. You get the names of all of those things. You open up data handles pointing to each template so that you can reference them later for reading in data. You make sure you keep track of which the root nodes are, where, the, where somebody isn't specializing something, because that's important for doing the recursive descent and then you build your specialization tree. So you have a list of all the templates and you match up all the pointers so everything knows what it's all about. So now you've got this big tree of empty, of empty templates that are pointing to their parent. It's just preparation work. Um, okay, so here's the, I, I renamed it to forest because there's actually uh, multiple routes, right? We have actor, interactive, non-interactive, trap, emitter, blah, blah, blah. There's, uh, for example, I put in the actor Actor has actor good, actor evil, custom, ambient, derived from that. Actor is going to be a very simple template which has in it, uh, okay, we're going to need an aspect component, a common component, we're going to need a, uh, an actor component, and it's going to set some reasonable default values for that. So if you specialize an actor off of this base thing, it's probably going to work okay. It's not going to include things like models because it doesn't make sense to have a default for that. So it does require that somebody else, when they specialize it, they add in something. And that's what the actor good and evil and all that stuff does. They go customize it and say, okay, well, now the, uh, the alignment is good or the alignment is evil, and we put a custom brain in there because it makes more sense for the evil guys to act this way and whatever, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, then, like, actor ambient, um, they'll set values like you can't attack them, um, and then we've got the chickens derived from that, of course. So it's, it's not the best arrangement, but, I mean, by the, the diagram, I'm not very good at drawing these. But uh, you get the idea of where we've, uh, where this used to have been implemented using some kind of C++ type structure. It's done using data now. And you can rearrange this all you want. It doesn't really matter. The game doesn't care. It's all about reuse. It's all about chicken red derives from base chicken because it wants to reuse a bunch of data in there and then change something to red and then maybe change some other effect. That's all it's for. And then there's the template again. So the template is pretty simple. It just says the name, chicken white, Category is something for the designers. I don't remember what that's for. Doc is, again, one of those lousy documentation. I try my best, but they just don't set it right. Specializes is what it's based on. So whenever it's constructed, it knows who to copy its data from. Before, it specializes things like the textures used on the aspect. We're, we're changing, changing it to a white chicken texture here. We're adding on some custom template triggers. That's all custom DS stuff, but you get the idea here that uh, these are customizing the behavior, not the behavior, but the uh, values of the base, just like in C++. The third part of starting up, the, we're still starting up the game here, is just compiling all these things. 
So now that you've got your template tree, you recursively compile them root down for each of the, each of the root nodes. And it's important to do that so that you, you can always specialize off of something that already exists. Um, as data components are discovered inside of these specification files here, you add them. And all you do is just read in values and override the base template fields, right? So where we've got uh, physics component has a, a data value called break effect. It just sets whatever it was to feathers white, which is a string. That's all there is to it. It's actually a lot simpler than it sounds. And this is all similar to C++, right? Whenever you initialize um, base, base, base class, it goes to the base first and sets its parameters, and then the derive class sets its stuff, and then the, you know, the, not parameters, the, the member values. Um, some important notes on this. We want to make sure it's a flat tree for performance reasons. Um, you could end up with a very deep tree if you have a designer goes crazy and says, okay, we're going to have this crazy, like, nine, ten level deep thing, um, everything specializing everything else. Well, if you instantiate one of these things, you don't want to have to refer to base, base, base to see which one's ever written. So I want to keep it completely flat so that whenever this stuff is compiled, it flattens it on the fly. Very important. It also uh, permits a special read uh, optimization. So, again, there's the, the, the parallel. There's the Go data component and the Go component. Go component is the live... Uh, real-time session stuff. It's going to have member variables in it, like in, in this case, the physics component is going to have a break effect value inside of it. Well, if that can never change, and it's always going to play the same effect, why bother storing it in there, right? If the component knows who its data component is, you can just take the get function on that component and just have it ask the data component what the value is. And since all the data components are shared among any instantiations of these things, you save the memory. You don't have to worry about initializing the value. You don't have to worry about persisting it in a save game. So it's good to flatten as much as possible. Uh, right. I also recommend copying on write for these things. This all depends on, on the quantity of these things. But we've got so many of these things in Dungeon Siege, I had to optimize a lot of stuff. In fact, I had to eliminate the entire lower, like the leaf level of the, of the trees, like the very bottom of the specialization tree. I had to get rid of that because there were so many of them. Nodes, there were about 500 of them, so that was okay to compile at startup. But on the fly, we'll compile the, the most leaf templates and then keep them in memory for a certain amount of time. Stuff I got to do. So editor integration. This is almost trivial. It was so easy for me to put this in there because all the tools are already ready, right? The editor is probably going to have some kind of property sheet thing. They all got them. Unreal editors got one. Um, and it's the standard thing where you've got like the name of the object and the type and then the value that you type in and then maybe a doc field or you hover over it and it gives a doc. So you have something like that in your editor, right? This is effectively a one-entry view into the global database of, uh, you know, the, the GoDB that I was talking about, where every single Go is an individual line inside there. You load up a level in your uh, editor, and you click on something, say properties, and it, it's a view into the database. So all you got to do to make that work is you just map the types and names onto the fields. You, you take the, the schema that you've already got, and you just map it onto this property sheet. And if someone changes the value but they want to set it back to the default, that's easy to do. You just go back to the Go data component and ask it what its value was. Um, yeah, and of course, add a tool tip for docs. It's always good. For DS, the way that I implemented it was um, I added a, a component, actually, was what implemented our editing system. I just added a new component. If you're in the editor, automatically, whenever you create a new Go, it just sticks a Go edit component on there, and that thing manages it. And it's just a few hundred lines of code, and it does... It's, it's just a transform. It, it knows how to map its own internal stuff onto what the editor needs, and that's all there is to it. Um, double buffers so that you can do a cheap rollback. So whenever someone's editing something in the property dialog and they hit cancel because they don't want it, it just takes the one buffer copy that it had and sticks it over the existing, over the, the real one. And because all the data is kept, that's pretty far back, but all the data is kept in the Go data component as just like a big pile of raw data, reverting to the unedited version as simple as just a mem copy, which is convenient. <laughs> um, also, it, it automates the saving um, because all you have to do is uh, you've got your constant data and you've got your real-time modified data in the editor. You just compare which ones are different and then you save out the ones that are different into the instance file. And that saves memory on the disk. Uh, permitting force to run. That doesn't matter. So here's an example instance specification. Whenever the editor, whenever Siege Editor um, saves out an object, it looks something like this. We've got the type is the chicken red. That's the name of the template. The name is just, we have a, all the static content in our game has an ID on it. Call it a skid static content ID. 
So that's that. Um, and then all of the, custom, the stuff that the designer has customized is inside of here and nothing else. Uh, ignore the P and the Q on the placement. So what almost always gets over, uh, overridden is the position and orientation, because they have to place it somewhere. And it's not going to be you know, identity. And they have to orient it somehow. It's probably also not going to be identity. Um, in this case, they've chosen to override the screen name, the super chicken, which I don't, it's not a good idea for uh, our, uh, well, anyway, it's not a good idea because of uh, localization. And uh, they've also decided to change the move velocity of this thing to three times what it was, 18 speeds. So this thing's really going to cruise. And the way they did this was by opening up the property editor, changing some values, hitting OK, and hitting save. And the GoEdit component takes care of all that. The next critical component of this is how do you load these things up? Um, as I mentioned, the, the objects are referenced by a content ID. So you're, you're cruising through the world, and the loader, it's running on a background thread, um, pulls in some node of the world, and it says, OK, what's on this node? What needs to be loaded in? It's got, a, it's got an index of all the skids that are on that thing. Looks up the instance, gets this block, and then it has to start, it figures out what template to use, you know, the, the, whatever, the chicken and it has to start instantiating a Go to fit that. So it asks the content database, which has the global collection of all the different templates, look up the chicken red, give it back to me as a pointer, and then iterate through all the blocks inside of that thing, iterate through all the Go data components. Create a Go, and then create one Go component that matches the Go data component exactly. You know, There's going to be a factory function that does all this. And then if the instance itself has specialized the data, in this case the placement, it will create a temporary Go data component that includes those overrides. Then once the Go is created, all the Go components are created, I iterate through all those, and I copy the values over from the data component and fill it in where needed. I don't know, it's really not that complicated. It sounds kind of complicated, but it's like, it's not that bad. The hard part is working with multi-threading, and I don't recommend it. So say you're gonna create a new C++ component. You can actually do this. Unlike with the old system where you had this crazy uh, tree, where you had to be very careful about where you inserted something into that tree. Creating new C++ components in a system like this is totally easy. You just stick it where, you just create it standalone, right? You specialize it off of Go component, and that's it. And you can have it do, you know, whatever it wants to do. You probably don't want it to duplicate any functionality of existing ones, but it's not, it's not that bad, even if it does. Um, you add a new block to the component schema. The first thing I pointed out way, way back, where we got the components.gas, so that it knows what values it can accept, the name of it, and all that. That's a key thing. You cannot add anything to this system without updating that one gas file, and it trains the engineers to do that so they don't forget to document their stuff, which is really important. They can't put something into the system. They cannot change it without also updating, without also updating that gas file. Very important, because it keeps the designers from uh, getting confused as to what things do. Um, right, factory method. Yeah, you'll, if you add a new component, you'll have to add a, an entry to the lookup table for the factory method. So it can map on, you know, Juki onto a function that says new go Juki. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. You probably don't want to write in C++. You want to write in the scripting language because it's so much easier. Writing new script components is way easy. You just create a new script file and you throw it in some directory and that's it. You also want to stick it in the template tree somewhere so that someone knows how to, uh, the game knows how to access it. But that's all there is to it. No recompiling, right? That's a really, really key point of, of adding a scripting support to your component system. Uh, right, that stuff doesn't matter. So managing the template tree is kind of a tricky issue. There's a lot of different types, right? Uh, you should probably have an engineer set it up first, divide it up based on functionality, like I had shown, like, uh, you know, have a UI object. UI, in our, in our game at the front end, we have all these little spinny UI thingies. Those are actually goes as well. That would be its own separate thing because it's so specific. Actors are another one. Non-interactive things are another one. Interactive things are another one. You want to have an engineer set up the base skeleton uh, data template tree and then hand it off to uh, production assistants or whoever to maintain. Engineers need to be working on code and let the guys who are close to the content maintain the content. And pretty much anyone can maintain these things once they're set up properly. Every once in a while, you should go poke around and make sure they're not you know, doing anything crazy, um, which they always are. Um, like data duplication is, is a good example of that. Very frequently, they'll, uh, they'll copy-paste a bunch of stuff. And instead of putting the common stuff into the base template, they'll just leave it 
in the drive. And that doesn't really hurt anything except it costs more to maintain and it's more uh, bug prone and it uses more memory and whatever, but it's not that bad. I recommend adding one branch or one tree in the forest just for test templates. So they don't mess with any of the other stuff. So people don't start deriving uh, custom you know, test underscore chicken um, off of the main chicken. Just have a completely separate tree that you can stick all that stuff into. Prefix it with some kind of dev underscore test underscore so it doesn't pollute the, you know, the global namespace. And uh, we ended up with quite a few of those, 150. It's just, you know, someone will go, I wonder what, what uh, I want to test out this new feature I'm adding to the game. So they'll create a little script component or whatever that tries it out. And they'll stick it in some directory, and then they'll add a, a test template just to try it out. And they always end up staying. But you can just, we have a, a feature in the, the, our, our gas thing that lets you mark something as development only. So whenever you compile the retail version of the resource file, it just strips them out. Oh, yeah, this stuff. So direct and automatic editor support. I did, in fact, mention that. Um, one cool thing, though, is de designers construct, can construct their own types to place in the editor. Um, this is something that surprised me on Dungeon Siege. I wasn't expecting this. Um, whenever I wrote the system, I was expecting less than 100 different unique types, and we ended up with thousands. And part of the reason for that is that the designers don't really want to mess around with tweaking values that much, what they, at least on our game. They want to be able to just put stuff down as fast as possible because the world's so huge. So what they do is instead of having a ch you know, one chicken and then they customize a few color things about it, they'll go and create one for each color so that they can just find the, uh, each of the colored chickens in their little uh, selection tree and then place those down one at a time. So we'll have two trees nearly identical except for the scale is different. One will be called Big Tree. <laughs> so anyway, they were able to go and create all this stuff on their own. It, it didn't really mess with the game because they didn't, they didn't do that many of them. But it was really cool because they were able to... It, on their own, they came up with a way to, to make themselves more efficient using our own existing tools, which I always love. Um, you can make global changes very easily. I don't know how other tools work, but something that I liked about this one is because uh, everything specializes off the template, even the instances, if you change something at the template level, it affects the entire game, which is uh, both good and bad depending on what you're working on. Obviously, if you make a far-reaching change that affects, you know, the sight range of monsters or something, it may affect performance that you weren't expecting. Um, and, of course, reorganizing the template tree is easy. I think I already mentioned that. But rearranging all this stuff at will is a very powerful feature. And... No, it doesn't matter. So I can't end this without talking about some of the pitfalls. And there are some pitfalls. For some reason, and I don't know if this is specific to the component system, I don't think it is, but the components end up becoming intertwined anyway. Um, the, some of the operations become order dependent. It's more convenient in this case because the, uh, the order, because it's not done using the compiler, it's done through our own code. Whenever I hand a message out to every single component, I do it in the order I want to do it in. I don't let some you know, virtual function override whatever determine that. So I can take that, I can put attach a priority to each component and abstract it out and then sort by that. Um, so I think it's more manageable. But for some reason, a lot of our components became pretty intertwined. Like, the, you can't have an actor without an, having an inventory because they just mess with each other all the time. Um, it's also a little too easy to add templates. We were actually auto-generating about 2,000 of ours using a Perl tool. Uh, Dungeons each has three different worlds. There's normal, elite, and veteran. And to generate the really, really hard levels, there's this Perl tool that goes and takes a bunch of stuff and basically copy paste it and replace a bunch of values in there. Um, we did that because we ran out of time and that was the easiest way to do it. But man, it really hits the CPU if you do that. So sometimes the, the ease of adding new templates is actually a problem. One quote, one favorite quote of mine, I don't know where I got it from, but um, with power comes responsibility. With any system that lets you go and do crazy stuff in data, it is not something you should take lightly. Um, you want to watch very carefully to make sure that people are using your systems right. Because whenever something goes wrong, they probably won't know that it's going wrong and they won't tell you about it. And you won't find out about it until it's already, you know, milestone time or whatever. It's very important that people understand the power of the tools and they use them um, in an efficient way. Cause it's very easy to, uh, you know, if you data drive everything, you have to implement a lot of rules in your engine to go make sure that people are not typing in bad stuff, which I ended up doing, which isn't that bad, but you can never uh, look out for every possible thing that could go wrong. 
Um, one thing I wanted to talk about the future a little bit before I wrap up. The schema is actually very extensible, right? It's just a class that has a list of objects in it, like a name and type and flags and that stuff I mentioned. Well, another thing you can put in there is maybe make the default value scriptable. This is something that I plan to do but never got around to. If the default value was actually a piece of script code, then on the fly you could run the script and determine what the actual values ends up as. So I, I had intended to use this to slightly vary the, uh, the, uh, si the scales and the colors of the monsters so they look a little bit different. So every time it would start up, it would run a little piece of script code that would just run a little random thing. And that was something that would just actually go into the data and wouldn't be something the code has to mess with. Just an idea. Another thing you can do is add constraints. This is something that databases actually have, is they have constraints. In order to put something into the system, it has to pass the constraints, such as an integer has to, between these, has to be between these two values. Or this is a color, meaning that it has to be an RGB. Well, one thing you can do is if you know the constraint, you can actually add interface to this, the editor for that. So if you know it's a color, you can bring up a color chooser. If you know that it's a value between 1 and 100, you can bring up a little slider that they can mess with. If you know that it is the name of an effect that can run, you can bring up a list box. Right? And they don't have to be typing in stuff manually. You can auto-detect all that stuff completely from data. Well, that wraps it up, I guess. I didn't have a conclusion. Um, my website will soon, I just finished this talk, so whenever I get back home, I'm going to upload this to my website. Thank you all for coming. Does anyone have any questions? In the back. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, sort of memory layout of your uh, underlying code completely and whether you need to worry about fragmentation or It's a PC. We don't care about fragmentation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, like, I know the, the PlayStation and stuff have to worry about it, but on a PC, Never, never has I've never run into a problem with it. Um, it's it's not very efficient, probably, to answer your question. But we never notice. Our, our problems come from uh, AI queries <laughs> all the time, or too many effects, or whatever. We never notice that stuff. Uh, in the back. I'm not quite sure I understand. The question is about uh, providing multiple ways of hooking a particular event path. Is that right? Uh, no, basically, it's simply the event for uh, a message that you're sending that none of your components know how to answer. Oh, if, it, if a component receives, or if uh, Go receives something that none of the components know how to answer, it just ignores it. Does that answer your question? Does it have to search to ignore? Yep. It yeah, it does have to search to ignore, but it's never showed up on the profiler, so I didn't really look into it. Um, over there. Right, the question is about what happens if you change a field, change its type, change its name, change its whatever. Um, well, actually, the this, this system's kind of self-healing because uh, what you can do is whenever the game loads it up, whenever, or whenever the editor loads up a map and those values aren't set, it just sets it to the default. Whenever it saves it out, it eliminates. Like if you remove the old one, it just gets rid of it, right? It's kind of like if it doesn't know about it, then it doesn't bother to load or save it. So it, it kind of heals itself. And we've done that a number of times where we've changed something or whatever, and then the, edit, the designers have to go through all the regions and resave them to clean it out. But the system doesn't really care if there's, if there's crud left over, although I don't like it because it takes up memory. Over there. Say again? Okay, the question is about uh, what, what form of, what's my storage method for the data? Yeah, um, I actually found the easiest way to do it is just to have two vectors, one with bits in it, or bytes in it, and one with uh, strings. And so anything that I detect as a, as a actually enums are stored as bits. So really, uh, 
if it's a, if basically if it's a binary object, I store it, uh, you know, directly as binary. And if it's a string, then I store it as an entry in the string list. And then an external structure says which maps onto what. There's like a, you know, the name. You look up the name based on the name of the column, and then it has an index of which storage unit it is. So it's either going to be the the, the the generic store of bits, or it's going to be the uh, the string store. Actually, there's two string stores because there's Unicode too. We got string Unicode strings, and then it has the index within that. So it's not really maps. I I try to avoid maps whenever I can um, for short length um, things. Like arrays less than ten objects inside of there. It's not it's not any faster, and it just eats up more heap. Over there. Why don't I use XML? Because uh, this was the this our existing gas system was there before I, I started. I do intend to switch to XML because then we can actually use the real editors and all that all the you know the millions of tools that people have developed. XML kicks ass. Although we're still going to have to custom code our own you know loading and unloading dynamically and binary compile stuff just to make it compatible. Anyone have anything? Yeah. And the question was about what happens if you want to do a subtractive inheritance. You want to remove information rather than add it. Um, and in our current system, we don't have that. I, uh, I would think that if we had a need like that, then there's something broken with our layout of the tree. I know that we've had um, we've had needs for no, no, I don't think we we haven't needed that yet. But it wouldn't be that hard to add. You just add like a little tag that means remove me or whatever. But you know, now that the code's been there for a year and a half, it would probably break a bunch of stuff if I did that. So I'd rather just make the data not do that. <laughs> but no, we, to answer your question, we don't have anything like that. OK. Oh, one more. Okay, the question is about what happens whenever the script um, properties change in some way. If you were to remove it, um, well, you can't remove it or rename it on the fly while the game is running. Um, so it would have to be outside of that. You're talking about the data. Well, you, you actually can do that, but we reload everything anyway, so it's fixed up. But you're talking about what the, the data that's been saved out by the editor? Oh, it just ignores it. The script would have a default value. That's a, this is kind of a philosophy of mine, um, is that the game should never, ever crash under any circumstances. And even if it does crash, it should catch it and continue if possible. Um, and a big important part of that is that there should be default values for everything, reasonable defaults for everything. If you place an object in the world, it shouldn't require anything else besides that. So if a script is getting invalid values, it should still be able to run just fine. And I have exception handlers and stuff that catch bad stuff and then, you know, we Complain loudly, but continue. So it probably wouldn't. It would probably continue to run fine. At the worst, you'd get an error, um, I think. But I guess it would be possible if you had two values and one of them was missing and the other one depended on that, you could cause something bad to happen. In those cases, we just catch them as we find them. In practice, it hasn't been a problem, as far as I know, Eric. <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. Well, I better uh, wrap this up and let these guys. Been there, been here since six. Go home. So, thank you all for coming. Oh, and uh, don't forget to fill out your little yellow thingy.